Sup Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So way back in 2020, I did a video on whether creatine supplementation can cause hair loss, and I have made other videos where I've talked about the same subject years before even that. This has been a very popular and somewhat controversial subject that has been hotly debated within the hair loss community for over a decade. Looking back at these videos I have done, they have all centered around the so-called rugby study, which is called that because its subjects were all South African rugby players. This study is very well known by hair loss sufferers across the globe, and it is often the very first thing that gets cited when people try to establish a connection between creatine use and hair loss. This study first appeared in 2009, and it seemed to show that short-term use of creatine actually increased DHT levels, which theoretically could worsen hair loss in people with the genetics for androgenic alopecia. In my previous video, I made the point that the study design was pretty good, since it was a randomized placebo-controlled study, and my only real objection to the study was that the sample size was small, being just 20 subjects total. But I also thought that most likely taking creatine wouldn't have any effect on scalp DHT if you were already on a 5AR blocker like finasteride or dutasteride. The study did seem a little concerning about whether creatine could worsen hair loss if you weren't on a 5AR blocker. However, that didn't seem like a very important issue to me, since everybody who is serious about hair loss probably should be using a 5AR blocking drug, or at least something comparable to combat DHT on the scalp, like maybe a topical anti-androgen. I've always been a little skeptical about the DHT-raising effects of creatine, because if it could really raise DHT levels enough to cause hair loss, then creatine would also be linked to other DHT-related problems, like in large prostate and acne, yet it seems it's only hair loss people talk about with creatine use, so it makes the claim seem pretty bogus. Personally, I've used creatine off and on, and I don't currently use it even though I do think it works. Personally, I think maybe it lets me handle a little bit more volume in the gym, but other than that, I don't find it that useful as an ergogenic aid. At no point using it, however, did it ever seem to affect my hair one way or the other. The way creatine works is that it is a non-essential amino acid, meaning your body produces it naturally, and it is involved in the rephosphorylation of ATP. So, without going too deep into the biochemistry since that's beyond the point, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. What it is, it is your body's most readily available energy source, and it is the energy source you use first during exercise, especially during high-intensity anaerobic training, like strength training. When ATP is used, it is broken down into adenosine diphosphate, which is ADP. Creatine phosphate is the active form of creatine, and it basically rephosphorylizes ADP by turning it back into ATP. So the theory behind creatine's use as an ergogenic aid is that by supplementing it, you give your skeletal muscles more baseline ATP levels, which helps with high-intensity anaerobic training like weight training, powerlifting, or any sport that requires short-term explosiveness like sprinting or pole vaulting. As such, it is not considered very useful for oxidative training like distance running or cycling. So even though the rugby study wasn't exactly overwhelming evidence, it still made me a bit hesitant to enthusiastically recommend using creatine given the results of the study, despite the small sample size. I always felt that this was a subject that needed more research, which is why it is especially fortunate that about a year after my last video on creatine was uploaded, a review article on creatine was published that analyzes the flaws of the rugby study in more detail and presents other reassuring data on creatine as a hair-safe supplement. This article is titled, quote, Common questions and misconceptions about creatine supplementation. What does the scientific evidence really show? Unquote. This article doesn't just address the hair loss issue with creatine. It is a thorough literature review that answers 12 questions that are often raised about creatine use. So I recommend this article to anyone who is using or thinking about using creatine, specifically in regard to hair loss. The authors do conclude that, quote, the majority of available evidence does not support a link between creatine supplementation and hair loss or baldness. Unquote. So, how do the authors reach this conclusion? Well, first they go over the rugby study and point out a series of flaws in this study. The design of the study is shown here. 20 young men were randomized to receive either capsules containing creatine plus glucose or containing just glucose as a placebo. For the first week, the creatine dose was 25 grams per day. After that, the creatine dose was 5 grams a day for two more weeks. The groups were then switched, and the men who had previously received placebo got creatine and vice versa. So neither the players nor the researchers knew who was getting creatine or placebo during the study, which is what is called a double-blind study, and so this study design was very good despite the small sample size. During each phase of the study, blood was drawn before treatment, after the 7-day creatine loading period, and after 21 days of creatine or placebo. 
total testosterone and DHT levels were measured in each blood sample, the ratio of DHT to testosterone was also calculated. So, the main results of the study are shown in this table right here. In the creatine group, there was a 56% increase in serum DHT after 7 days of creatine loading versus baseline, and there remained a 40% increase after 21 days of creatine. The ratio of DHT to testosterone was increased 36% after 7 days of creatine loading, and there remained a 22% increase in this ratio after 21 days of creatine. These changes in DHT and DHT to testosterone ratios were statistically significant significant compared to the control group. There was no statistically significant changes in testosterone levels in the creatine group. In the placebo control group, there were no statistically significant changes in DHT, testosterone, or in the ratio of DHT to testosterone. So, what's wrong with this analysis, you may ask? Well, in this review article by Antonio, several problems with the methodology and conclusion are pointed out. One problem is the conclusion that the authors of the rugby study draw from their data. They conclude that since the testosterone levels in the creatine group didn't change, then that must mean the increase in DHT levels, as well as the DHT to testosterone ratio, Ratio must be due to the enhancement of the 5AR enzyme that converts testosterone into the trash hormone DHT. However, as we're about to see, some other studies have shown that creatine may increase testosterone levels, which would cause increased DHT levels without enhancing the 5AR enzyme. Unfortunately, in the rugby study, it is still possible that the increase in DHT was related to increases in testosterone because in the study, only total testosterone levels were measured. Free testosterone, as well as what's called bioavailable testosterone were not measured. Bioavailable testosterone, what that refers to is the free testosterone plus the testosterone that is weakly bound to the protein albumin in the blood. Neither of these active forms of testosterone were measured in the study. It's this bioavailable testosterone that is available to be converted into DHT. So it is possible that even if total testosterone stayed the same in the study, bioavailable testosterone could increase, resulting in an increased DHT without enhancing the 5AR enzyme. Once again, we don't know because free testosterone or bioavailable testosterone wasn't measured in the rugby study. But that's a relatively minor problem compared to the other problems with this study. The real problem with this study is what I pointed out in my previous video on creatine, which is that the number of subjects is very low. There are only 20 subjects in the study. It turns out though that there were actually fewer subjects than even that because four subjects dropped out leaving only 16 subjects who completed the study. The fewer the number of subjects, the greater the possibility that you can see results that are due just a random chance. It's easy to understand why that would be so. Here's an example. Suppose you toss a coin 50 times and every time it comes up as heads. That would be a significant result and you would have to conclude that something was wrong with the coin, like maybe it was a two-headed coin. You could be very confident of this after 50 coin tosses that came up heads. However, suppose you just tossed the coin three times and it came up heads. It's possible you have a two-headed coin here, but more likely it is just a normal coin because getting three heads in a row isn't all that rare. In other words, the more data or subjects you have in a study, the more confident of the results. Translating this into this rugby study, if there were 200 subjects in the study, then you would be a lot more confident of the results than if there were just 20 subjects. I think that's just common sense here. So at this point, you might be saying, but Kevin, the rugby study must have done statistics to take into account the number of subjects, and they still found that creatine raised at the HT levels. It was a statistically significant increase, so what's your problem, bro? Well, yeah, they did do statistics. Now, I don't want to get too deep into the statistics, but let me just say that what they did was they compared the changes in DHT between the creatine group and the placebo control group. So, when doing this kind of statistics, any changes in DHT levels in the placebo group will affect whether or not the increase in the DHT level in the treatment group is statistically significant. For example, if there was a rise in the DHT in the creatine group, but there was also an equal rise in the control group, the statistics would then say that the rise in DHT in the creatine group was not significant. In other words, it's just due to chance. Well, probably the number of subjects was so low, there were random differences in the two groups that most likely impacted the statistics. For one thing, the baseline DHT in the creatine group was 23% lower than the placebo group, as you can see right here. So, the groups were not that comparable to begin with. 
Even worse than that though, the DHT and the placebo group actually went down at the same time that the DHT and the creatine group went up. The authors of the creatine review article concluded that this small decrease in DHT in the placebo group combined with a small increase in DHT in the creatine group was enough to explain the statistically significant increase in DHT found in the study. It's very likely that if a larger study had been done, these supposedly significant changes would be found to be just due to chance. The review article also points out that the changes in DHT levels and the DHT to testosterone ratios are all within the normal limits of these hormones in the body. Also, keep in mind there are no basic research studies showing that creatine increases 5-air enzyme activity. That's right, Chooms, there aren't even any rodent studies showing creatine affects DHT levels. Also, the results of the rugby study have never been duplicated in any other study, so this study stands alone as a true outlier study. Remember too that the study looked just at hormone levels, and it didn't look at all at the effect of creatine on hair growth. In fact, there are no studies that have ever shown any deleterious effects of creatine on hair growth. Also, keep in mind that exercise itself causes a very short-term increase in both testosterone and DHT levels. If creatine really allows for increased exercise capability, then that might lead to a greater increase in DHT than with placebo just because the rugby players could work out harder. So the increase in DHT would only be indirectly linked to the creatine in that case. However, this increase in DHT after exercise only lasts an hour, so don't be worried that exercise is going to make you lose your hair. But I do have to wonder in the rugby study whether in sub-subjects, maybe the samples were drawn right after exercise, which would affect the DHT and possibly testosterone levels. Just as an aside, for those people who are worried that exercise raising testosterone can hurt your hair, I did do a video on that particular subject and the bottom line is that testosterone by itself doesn't affect hair growth. If increased testosterone also raises DHT, then theoretically that might hurt your hair, but only if you are not on a 5-air inhibitor like finasteride or dutasteride. So getting back to the rugby study, it is just an absolute mess, and the data supporting creatine hurting hair growth is very shaky, if not totally non-existent. There have actually been at least 12 other studies looking at the effects of creatine on hormone levels. Two of the studies showed small, physiologically insignificant increases in testosterone with creatine use, while the other studies showed no increase in testosterone at all. Unfortunately, these studies didn't look at DHT levels, but if the majority of the research shows no increase in testosterone, then it is safe to say it also doesn't increase DHT levels since we know creatine doesn't increase 5-AR activity. There was a clinical trial that was supposed to look at creatine and hair loss, but apparently it was withdrawn because its sponsor, which was a company called Legion Athletics, decided to stop funding of the study. So why do they stop funding? Well, I don't know. Maybe the company which makes supplements for athletes, including creatine supplements, felt that they might hurt their business if they found out creatine caused hair loss. But anyways, this review article, what it concludes is that creatine does not increase free or total testosterone, nor does it increase DHT or cause hair loss. And I have to agree with this conclusion, Shooms. This widely quoted rugby article is completely bogus, and there's no reason to worry about using creatine if you have androgenic alopecia. So let's please put this argument rest at least until more serious research comes out, okay? Cool. See you next time, Chooms. God bless.